two hour drive, but it's, it's definitely in a daze. Um, you know, I get there and I get to the meadows and, you know, stay high the same people every day, you know, so it's kind of nice. It's, it's part of my routine. Um, and depending on what horses I want to drive there late or Northfield early, you know I mean? Like I usually try to take my best chance. If I have a horse with the best shot late at the meadows, I'll stay there the whole card. You know, if I feel like I, you know I mean? Like I just trying to mix it up to, if I feel like I like the horse at Northfield early better then I'll do the same. But, um, you know, with the post times now, you know, I've got to be a little bit more strategic with it. Um, and, you know, and then I get to Northfield and I race almost till midnight, you know, it's, uh, it, it's grueling. And I kind of like it. That it's only four days a week, to be honest with you right now, you know, I get three days at home for the most part. Although on Fridays, I try to go to Sada or another Ohio track, but that's only a half a day. Um, my son, like I said, my son's lives with me and he's older, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't really like racing a ton. He just watches me race. You know, he doesn't really like it because of, um, just me when I've been hurt, uh, you know, numerous times it, it, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> he doesn't bode well with that. But, um, once I'm in the groove, it's a lot easier for me. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's going to be hard for me to get back rolling. I think at first only because you're so used to getting in your car and, and going, you know what I mean? And it's, and sometimes, like I said, even when you're rolling, it, it's tough to get up out of bed and say, Oh gosh, you know what I mean? I got to be in this car for four and a half hours at least today and, and go. But like I said, when, when you see that horse's butt, I know it sounds like kind of corny. Um, it, you know, and I, and I have the opportunity to race with a lot of my peers and my friends it sure does make it easy. I'm, I'll be honest with you. And, and, and just, uh, yeah, I love to race horses. So that's, that's pretty much and, my uh, day. <laughs> yeah. It'd be a, a crazy amount of kilometers put on your vehicle, obviously in the hour spent in a car. I think we estimated you probably drink 2,500 cups of coffee minimum a year. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just a final question on that. Uh, in a in a weird way, uh, would this uh, downtime give you a chance to freshen up a little bit? You know what? In a way, yes. Um, I have just gotten an accident um, in in February, and like I'm sure I don't, I don't want to publicize this, but it was my my twelfth recorded concussion, um, which is probably not a good thing. Uh, all from accidents, um, you know, being hospitalized. So I'm a medical record, and I was unconscious for 45 minutes. Um, I got back within about a week. I pushed it, but my neurologist says only because I've had so many, like I, I know, you know, what my body is, but um, I'm still dizzy a little bit. So when I move my head the wrong way, so it's definitely, definitely helped me um, and some other aches and pains I've had. That's good. But it's also hurt me. I think, you know, I mean, your body gets acclimated to that pain and, and the few things that you know, might be wrong and, you know, your body just copes with it, you know, and, and I, I, these guys will tell you once you're behind the gate, your adrenaline's going like, believe me, you, you know, you're not cold. You're not, you know, you're, you're not hot. You're just, you're out there and it's just you and the horse and that's it. So, um, it's always kind of like been my sanctuary to myself. Like I, you know I mean? It took me a long time to realize, you know what I mean? Like, and it was an accident that actually kind of made me realize to you know, make sure I have this, the, the better attitude all the time, you know, because I mean? this can be taken away from us at any point in time. But, um, the time has definitely done my body good, I'm sure. Um, but like I said, mentally it's, it's, it's hard, but I always try to think the positive. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, we'll get your take on that. Uh, your schedule a little bit different than Aaron's, but uh, long days for you too, right? You're, you're putting in a full day at the barn in the morning and then going to drive at night. Uh, how demanding is that? It gets tiring, especially on qualifying days when we have them in the afternoons. But uh, most other days I try and get out of there at a decent time when I'm done training and get a little bit of rest. So it's not too, too bad. And, and uh, you know, when you look at yourself, uh, you've really kind of quietly uh, moved in to become a, a regular face uh, on Canada's top circuit. In fact, uh, I think uh, at the time racing was paused, you're sitting fourth in earnings in Canada and, and not too far off the third spot. Um, so, I mean, when you, when you look at that, obviously the timing of the shutdown uh, was not what you wanted. No, definitely not. I mean, you don't want to miss a whole lot of racing if you can help it, but uh, I'm still keeping busy at the barn. So, you know, kind of stay in the groove a little bit, sitting behind horses every day. So I'll be looking forward to getting back to it, though. Yeah. And Montrell, uh, in your operation, uh, you, you've got overnight horses, obviously, and you, you do drive overnights, but you've always got good young talent to, to look forward to uh, each fake season. Um, so, you know, what's the atmosphere like at, at a time of year where – you generally be very excited. Um, has that changed at all, or is it kind of straight ahead with your young horses and, and hoping you can get back at it very soon? So. No, no, you're right. It definitely has changed. Um, usually we're gearing up and ready for the 
any stickers that are coming like Ohio and um, getting them ready for Delaware. But right now we just turned them out for a month because we didn't know what the schedule was going to be for the stake races. So after we turned them out, we just brought them back and started jogging very easy until we got further word on act when we've got to be ready. Uh, how old were you when you, you started helping out around the barn and, and kind of thinking you, you were pretty serious about wanting to work with the horses? Uh, from as far as I can remember, I was always at the barn instead of daycare. Um, I was always looking after myself uh, around the horses nonstop going underneath them and they, they know the difference between a little kid and a grown adult. They won't mess with me with the mess with the other ones. But um, yeah. I don't remember going to daycare. I don't remember like preschool and all that stuff. I was always at the barn. Yeah. What do you think of the horses that uh, have been developed uh, from the Teague stable over the years? Yeah. Uh, did you maybe, uh, did you, you take for granted uh, you know, when you'd walk into the barn and see these champions. We're going to bring up a graphic, in fact, and uh, and look at just uh, just some of the horses that have come out of the operation. It's incredible. And uh, do you often get a chance to reflect back on some of these great horses you guys have had? Yeah, we, we talk about them ever so often. Uh, definitely Wiggles is definitely the most uh, recent in our head, but we always talk about Lather Up. Western East is still on the field with Wiggles all the time. Uh, Lather Up, we're breeding him now, and Rainbow Blue, you'll never forget her. But yeah, they're always they're all still there, and we're still breeding to Mr. Wiggles, uh, Badlands Nitro, and Lather Up. So yeah, they, we still talk about them, but not as much as uh, Wiggly Jiggly right now. Yeah, and you know uh, it, th that list is impressive, and you could compile another list uh, that long or longer with uh, horses you had that made four, five, six hundred thousand dollars. So. Uh, yeah, it's been an incredible operation, and uh, it's got to be extra gratifying, right, to, to be able to work with, uh, like you said, uh, your father and, and uh, the rest of your family and kind of do it together. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, instead of winning a race for a top trainer, you don't really get to hang out with them the next day and actually get a bushel of crabs and, I can't cuss, but uh, grab beer and, you know, shoot the S, you know. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's definitely more gratifying that I get to see my dad and my mom the people that I was, I was hugging in the winter circle the day before. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about uh, the big horse you just mentioned a, a moment ago, Wiggle It, Jiggle It. And, uh, yeah, what a career he has had. Uh, maybe just we're, we're going to take a look back, obvi obviously, one of his uh, biggest wins. But, uh, you know, what, what what's he up to now? We, we see saw that he had uh, made a bit of a comeback. Uh, hadn't been able to hit the winter circle, I don't think, just yet. But looked like he's still – Still got it to, to some extent. Yeah, I, I still think he has it. He did, he did win uh, one right when we got back January 2nd on my birthday. So that, that's the only reason I remember. Okay. Uh, he hasn't really come back to his complete self just because I think he needs a couple more races underneath him. And, I mean, he was way overweight. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, we yeah. looks like he, we just turned him out with Western Ace, and we're just bringing him back now. He's just trained back now. So we're just waiting for a definite answer on when Harrington's going to open or maybe we just got to wait till Dover. Uh, and, and what what is the expectation? I mean, it, it's hard to always predict uh, exactly how they're going to come back. But is there an expectation he can come back and be be at least close to the horse he was before? You know, you always wish, but I mean, he's done far enough for our, uh, to make to be gratified for our our family. So if he doesn't come back to where he was, it's no problem. He already did everything that we uh, wanted to accomplish. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's take a look back and. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the most memorable win of his many memorable victories, uh, the Little Brown Chug from back in 2015. Uh, just describe maybe that week leading up to it. For a young guy like you, uh, you've got the horse to beat in the sport's biggest pacing event. Uh, what was that week like for you in the lead-up? Uh, I was pretty nervous, just like any other race. But um, just being out there in the camper for until Sunday till Thursday, waiting up to the uh, – just waiting to go to race that day. Um, I was trying to keep my cop, trying to keep my cool, but it, it was tough. But uh, you always had the it. It was even better that you had the horse that you, everybody wanted to beat instead of one that you know you were hoping you're just happy to actually be in the race. So it made it a lot more fun. And Aaron, maybe we'll get you to chime in here, an Ohio boy, and um, you know you're you're a big part of the. Delaware, Ohio, and Jug Week, and uh, what was it like that year uh, when you get a superstar like Wiggle It, Jiggle It? Describe the atmosphere. 
uh, the atmosphere is unbelievable on any occasion. But um, to have a horse that, it, you know I mean, like, like the Teague family, I mean, let's just be real. I mean, they've done a phenomenal job. Like you said, the list of the horses they had and people just wish to have one horse, you know, um, you know, it, it shows a lot for their pedigree and, and, and what kind of trainers they are to be able to produce a horse um, over and over again. But that whip horse was, it was an amazing animal. You, I mean, and not to be one of the high bred horses. Um, I mean, he's a Mr. Wiggles. I mean, a high bred horse, I mean, not even the best gate, you know, he had a little funk to him, it seemed like, and, uh, but you know, he had three lungs and, and a bigger heart. So <laughs> to see like the horse of that and electricity in the air, when a horse like that wins that race is, is unbelievable and only probably be surprised if I would ever have the opportunity to, um, you know, win it. But, you know, I've been in there, you know, multiple times. I was one of the ones chasing, you know what I mean? But it's, it's okay. Uh, it, it's all about being there, but, um, you know, I envy Montreal and their family's done a phenomenal job. And I think, uh, like I said, that wiggle jiggle horse was unbelievable. Yeah. And Montreal, it's one of those races. We've watched it a few times dur during uh, this show in the last few weeks, as people recall it as one of their uh, favorite racing memories. And, uh, you know, the more you watch it, the less you can believe that he was able to win, uh, you know, the way the trip went and how it looked, especially on the last turn where he lost <clears throat> Uh, you know, maybe almost a length uh, turning into the home stretch. But uh, what were your thoughts, uh, you know, as the race was unfolding? I mean, realistically, at about the halfway point, what were you thinking? Uh, I, at the halfway point, I thought I actually still had a shot because, like Aaron said, he has three longs instead of two. Um, but once we got around the last turn and Dave ran off by about a length, I was like, this is going to be my only opportunity to actually win LeBron Jug and it's gone. Wow. Wow. Very candid response. Very candid response. Uh, we're going to take a look back now at uh, the replay, I believe, and uh, we'll uh, relive it with you. And, uh, yeah, maybe just walk yeah. us uh, through the early portions of the race here, Montrell, and uh, did things early on set up uh, to your liking? Not really. I mean, I had the rail and I lost, uh, lost the front just by a couple steps. They went right around me, so that wasn't uh... – really my game plan and then right here he jumps over to the shadow of the pylon so uh right there i didn't want the two holes so i just let yannick in front of me i try to wait as long as possible how uh, how close was he to actually going off stride in that first turn you know what wiggles does that like more than you can actually think so i wasn't really worried about him actually going off stride and staying off stride i was just worried about him actually keeping on like doing it over and over again but it, it was it made it even better that I actually uh, was to the outside end instead of on the front because I would have probably had to set too wide anyway. Yeah, uh, right in here. Are you just letting your horse idle up to the leader, or are you uh, you trying to race him right here? You know what? I literally let this horse do whatever he wanted, and he felt and there, he, he never. I never had a horse feel this strong that actually, when he eyes a horse, he does not like give in. He's got the biggest heart you ever see, but I was just letting him do whatever he wanted right here. And then uh, right around here, I tried to get my head in front to see if I can actually get in front of Dave. And once I didn't, I just I just waited it out. Yep. All right, let's uh, throw it to Roger for the final quarter of this epic Little Brown job. 27 seconds, and they're still going at it. Lost for words. Wiggler jiggling. The battle of the finish around the turn. Lost for words. Has the lead and starts. Wiggler Jiggler on the outside, second. Can anybody catch him from the back? Coming home, lost for words. Wiggler Jiggler, coming home, lost for words. Wiggler Jiggler, the final surge. One forty-nine, three fifths. I do not believe what I just saw. Wiggler Jiggler was beaten. He kept on coming. And nails lost for words in an epic little brown jug. Can you believe this? What, what a horse a, race. What a race. Oh, my that, goodness. Uh, that, that could be the best race, Sam. This could, be, this could be and, the uh, best race. And, again, I, I love hearing race. Sam McKee's raw emotion. Uh, you can hear it in his voice, uh, the late, great Sam McKee. And uh, there he is, Montrell, uh, in full stride. Uh, what what was the reaction of the crowd there as you were circling the backstretch and it looked like the crowd was was kind of cheering you on and you were interacting? What what was happening there? Uh, it was unbelievable. I wasn't really looking for anybody. I was just 
taking it all in. I was trying to go as slow as possible, just taking the whole moment because um, that was the only race I actually wanted to win. That was the most prestigious race of my career. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, what a beautiful animal there when he is in full flight, wiggle it, jiggle it. And uh, we certainly hope that he will get back uh, back into his winning ways here when racing resumes. We've got a trivia question, our first one of the night. Uh, Montrell, his first major stakes victory came with Custard the Dragon in which race? Custard the Dragon giving Montrell his first major stakes victory. And uh, can you tell us which race that was? Leave your answers in the comment section, and we will draw uh, from random at the end of the show from all of the winning answers. And that is for a $25 Cosa gift card. And we've got a special guest joining us, Aaron. Who, who do we have? Yeah. Uh, this is Red. Um, you know, I read here. I went and um, looked at him, and his name was uh, Obadiah. And I went back a week later. And they said someone had called him because he was on a website and um, said his name was Red. Um, he was an abused stray. Um, I've always had puppies, and I thought maybe for probably from now on, especially with him, um, I'll probably just uh, get a rescue and try to give them a you know good last few years of their life. And um, I'm, I'm a big animal lover, um, dogs, horses, whatever. Uh, but he's you know he's a little bit edgy around some people, but <laughs> um, he loves me, and I think I know he appreciates uh, what I did for him. Good stuff. Uh, Montrell and JD, do you guys have, have pets in the house? Uh, dog cat. She's a black lab, four years old. Nice. Cool. I got two Bernie Mountain dogs. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. Um, JD, uh, you know, we, we just uh, watched Wiggle It, Jiggle It, and uh, you had uh, the, the privilege of sitting behind a, a great pacing colt as well, and his name was Betting Line. Uh, early on in his three-year-old campaign. And uh, let's get a look at, at him, uh, a photo of betting line, who ultimately would win 20 of 27 career starts, a career winner of $2.2 million. And, uh, J.D., in the three-year-old campaign, uh, you got up behind him a couple of times early on. Uh, what, what kind of a thrill was that as you look back on it now? Well, he was a lot of fun to drive. He had a uh, just an unbelievable turn of foot to him. And, uh, you know, some of the times it didn't really look like he was in a spot where he could win, but uh, he never really felt like he was out of place when you're sitting behind him. He just picked them horses off so easy. And, you know, I think that's what was really impressive about him when you watch, uh, especially his replays now, there were races where you think uh, there's no way this horse can win where he's sitting. And uh, he would find a way. And, in fact, uh, he was only a half a length away from an undefeated three-year-old season. Uh, that first start uh, from off the pace, just missed and uh, never tasted defeat the rest of the year. How much of a difference sitting behind a horse like betting line, Jonathan, versus just a regular overnight horse? Can you feel the difference? Oh, yeah. I mean, horses like that, they make your job real easy, you know. Uh, it's it, They're hard to put in the wrong spot. They, they can take care of you even when you do make a little mistake where – a lot of other horses, they need some of them need the perfect trip for things to work out. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, his first gold victory of that 2016 season. You were on board for the win. Uh, what do you recall about uh, that night he was expected to win, and uh, were there any anxious moments? Um, not really. I mean, he gets run in a little bit in the turns, but uh, when he straightened up, he paced hard to the wire. We're going to get a look back at that replay now, and uh, we will take you to Mohawk Park. This is from early July, or late July, I should say, of 2016. So really just getting his season underway here. Uh, Jonathan, you had the outside post, but uh, not much of an obstacle for a Colt uh, with this much talent. Uh, no, it didn't. Like I say, you, if you got him in anywhere close to them at the head of the lane, he was going by them. And uh, this trip on this night, did it work out as you expected it would? Yeah, it was nice to see them uh, race a little bit up front, you know, and uh, actually get a uh, good trip out of it. And uh, when I tipped them off cover, he was really pacing. 
All right, let's throw it to Kenny Middleton with the call. This is from back in 2016. Betting line waits for him to move from in sixth. Further back, seventh, Carolina Hurricane. And underway from last is Cruise Patrol. So they come to the midway point, chasing Magnum J up front just over a length. Right there in the pocket spot, shadowing him as Arsenic. On the move now, semi-automatic is first up on the outside from in third. The rail fourth belongs to Print Media. Sintra is on the cover. Betting line gets covered times two at a 55 and two half at 20. 8 and 4 second quarter and now with a rush semi-automatic is trying to blast on by Magnum J Magnum J at the inside though holds the fort at the rail Back into third is Arsenic now. Sintra on the outside. Bumpy gated there from in fourth. Jameson keeps him to task, though he gaps his cover. Betting line is up into fifth now. He's a good four lengths off the lead, but rolling out wide at three quarters in 122 and one. And that was a wild third quarter of 26 and four. And it's Magnum J coming into the stretch now. Magnum J put away semi automatic, but on the outside, betting line starts to roll for jury. Magnum J put to deep stretch pressure, and betting line on the outside has got him. Betting line will win going away. Though he too got steppy in the stretch there. Drury keeps him to task. Betting line is very, very rough coming to the line. He won it by three lengths. Coming on in second is Sintra. Tight for show, the mile 150. Uh, Jonathan, coming to the wire, a little bit anxious for you? Uh, you know what? He put in a couple of little steps to second start back in the year i took a little bit of hold of him down near the wire because he was starting to face away from them and he did the same thing to me so i wasn't overly concerned about it but uh i think i just got him a little mixed up when i was shutting him down yeah and I, I mean how scary is that right winning in 150 and you've got to grab him uh, coming to the wire incredible talent yeah yeah. All right. So there he is winning in 150. And that, that really kind of kickstarted the season. And uh, so you were tasked with, uh, you know, qualifying him, giving him a couple of starts uh, for Casey Coleman. Uh, how much did that mean to you as a, a younger guy in, on the Mohawk circuit to get the confidence of Casey to sit behind a colt like this? Yeah, it was really nice, you know, and uh, very appreciative of the opportunity to drive a horse like that. And uh, it really helps you get going and get a chance to drive more horses for other people too absolutely and uh you know in terms of your um switch to mohawk full-time uh you know was there a definitive point where you you feel like you you kind of worked in and became a regular there or did it just sort of happen over time it, it just happened over time i started out driving a lot of kawartha and georgian and uh got hooked up driving for carmen Asiello quite a bit and he actually gave me a chance to go down and drive a little bit down in the States when he had some horses first go down there. And uh, once I come back home, I drove a very vast majority of his stable and uh, it kind of took off from there. All right. Well, let's uh, have a look at our second trivia question of the night. And uh, this one is on a uh, Jonathan Drury theme. Drove which millionaire pacer to his first career win. We'll give you a hint. He raced in the $1 million Metro final that same year. So again, which horse did JD drive to his first career win? A horse that would go on to millionaire status. And again, if you know the answer, leave that for us in the comments section. We will recap the questions and answers at the end of the show. And I believe we have our first question of the night that we're going to get to. And uh, I think it's for all three guys. Curtis uh, can bring that up. Yep, Barry McPherson with our first question of the night. Thank you, Barry, for tuning in. Uh, the question for all three guys, what horse from the past would you like to have had the chance to drive? Great question. And uh, Montrell, why don't we start with you on that one? Uh, my, my answer would definitely be some beach somewhere. Uh, he seemed like he was a big, powerful, strong colt, just like uh, Wiggle Jiggle, just a little bit faster, I think. And you guys had a Colt, uh, I think, from the same crop, right? Badlands Nitro raced against uh, the beach. All right, uh, Jonathan, we'll throw that one to you. Uh, which one would you like to have sat behind? I'd have to say the same as Montreal. You know, it was just incredible getting to be here to watch the beach, and uh, he probably would have been a lot of fun to drive. And Aaron, what about you? 
Um, probably Muscle Hill. Um, just even the charters he throws, uh, just such a pure gait to him. Um, was so dominant, uh, you know, in the way he raced. Uh, and I, I'm kind of more of a, I like trotters a little better, to be honest with you. Um, you know, when, when I was younger, like, I always like, be kind of like, <laughs> you had one that run, you know what I mean? Like, you kind of want to always, like, figure it out. So, um, I definitely, you know, I'm more partial to trotters, but a, a good horse is a good horse, but I think Muscle Hill for sure. Yeah, and uh, you took my next question away. I was going to ask you if you had a preference for thing versus uh, trotters or pacers, and uh, uh, maybe throw that to Jonathan and Montrell as well. Uh, given your preference, uh, do you prefer one gate over the other, J.D.? Uh, not really. I mean, trotters can be a little trickier to drive and, uh, I do enjoy driving them, but, uh, I wouldn't say I have a real particular, I mean, which one I drive. Yeah. And Montreal? Uh, I had the opportunity of driving more pacers, so I would probably pick pacer, but the, the trotters that I have drove, when you get a good one, it, it's, it's a great experience. So if I had the greatest trotter that year, I would definitely pick a trotter. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, uh, Aaron Merriman, so you're uh, part of Harness Racing history. Uh, you are the fourth driver in the history of the sport to reach 1,000 wins in a single season, but you are the only one to do it multiple times. And uh, there's a look at uh, the presentation on the night uh, you did it for the third time, third consecutive year with more than 1,000 wins, an incredible achievement. Uh, when you think about it, a thousand is a career milestone for many drivers. So to do it in a single season, three straight times, really, really remarkable. And uh, I mean, just tell us how much work goes into that, Aaron. Uh, you don't do that by accident. No, I mean it's it's a lot of work, um, and it's a lot of luck. Um, I, in my opinion, um, to be able to get back to you know to track to track, um, to be have the opportunity to drive nice horses, um, you know it's. You know, winning stake races, I always say this all the time, and you know, it makes I definitely that makes it you know great. Um, but like to me, like if any race feels good to me, um, winning every race. Um, but it's just it, it really actually this actually the second time I did it was actually it just meant so much, and I really didn't have, I think I had a shot last year, and um, to get it like you know, pretty much the last night we raced, I mean, it was it was pretty special. Um, and then this year I started off faster than I did any other year, so <laughs> which I don't even know how, but I did with less starts. I mean, just, you know, it, it, when you look back on it, you know, I mean, I don't even really think I understand it right now, but um, it's it's an unbelievable feeling. And when you look at the names that have done it, um, you know, it, you know, teacher Case and Morgan, I mean, these guys have been a staple in the business, um, even though Case had some, you know, some, uh, you know, skeletons or whatever, but you, you can't take away from the guy's talent. Um, you, I don't know. It's, uh, like I said, it's very, very surreal. And um, I actually get a little bit, I was actually a little emotional um, this past year. Like my son's in the winter circle, my father. You know, my mother wasn't, or my mom and my daughter weren't, wasn't, but um, just, you know, when you cross the line or whatever, man, this is like, you know, it's history. You know, it's a, you know, there's a chance maybe it never be repeated, um, but either way, I was the first one to do it. So maybe it'll happen again, maybe it won't, but it's not something I'm going to push. Yeah, and I mean, the number of drives uh, that, that you put up each year, it's uh, generally in the 4,500 range. Um, and you look at Tim <clears throat> Tietrick, I think the year he went over, uh, 4,700 drives, uh, Tony Morgan, similar. Um, and then, uh, and then Walter Case, uh, when you look at him, how remarkable is that? The first guy to do it back in 1998, and he did it with less than 3,000 drives. And uh, I think he put up a, a UDR of 506. Uh, pretty hard. Even you must shake your head at that and, <laughs> and marvel at what he, what he did that insane. year. That's <laughs> insane. It's insane if you think about it. These guys know it's so hard, and that's one thing I probably more think of. I, I don't ever like to look at stats, look at my numbers, um, especially during the year. I, I just kind of want to grind it out, be that guy, you know. But I always want to try to be. I'm always like, be one, two, three, like be one, two, three. That's where I want to be. You know what I mean? Um, you, you, you just, I probably overdrive a lot. You know what I mean? But um, for Walter to bat five oh six, that's insane. That's like that's a number you bat when you have like you have five drives at a track and you had like really good stake horses. You know what I mean? And they race yeah. good, and you and you. Oh man, I've won three out of my five, and that's that's insane to you know have, have any amount of drive to uh, to carry that kind of average. Um, but you know, at Yonkers, like any, you know, I talked to Walter, and he says, you know, I, I mean, he had his choice between one and eight horses or whatever he wanted, you know, and, and the inside there makes a big difference. But even so, like these guys will tell you, you want to be the have the best horse in the race, but 
it's still not easy. I mean, there's seven or eight other guys out there or nine, you know, in Jonathan's case, a lot of times that, that want to win the race just the same. They're not trying to, they're not letting the favorite win, you know, like uh, people think all this stuff, or whatever. And, and unfortunately, most of the time, we don't know if these horses are sick or tied up till after the race. So they also can throw in um, bad starts and, or gamblers make you the false favorite, which I get a lot, <laughs> um, especially on a half mile <laughs> track. But um, for this guy to bat 500 is, is absolutely insanity. Yeah. And you know what? Let's uh, ask you quickly about that. Uh, you, you said you're you're a false favorite a lot of time, and that comes with the territory, right? When you're uh, you're the top gun at a track, uh, guys are betting uh, anything that Aaron Merriman drives, and uh, there's a bit of pressure with that, is there not? Yeah, there is in a way. Um, I I pretty much drive the same most of the time, but it, it, sometimes it bothers me when I got a horse that like legitimately would be you see it's double digit odds everything in the program, and then you're two to five or three to five, and then. And you got to race them like that almost. I mean, like Norfield's one of the higher, they bet a lot of money there, like just like Woodbine. They bet a lot of money there. Um, people are watching, and they don't want their horse to get a conservative trip to where, you know what I mean, you can't drive against the way you usually drive, you know, a, a two or three to five shot or whatever. But, I mean, there is some pressure, but that stuff doesn't bother me. It bothers a lot of gamblers. That's why I'm not even on Facebook because <laughs> I have Facebook <laughs> Messenger, there, but they, if they don't see me on Facebook, I don't think they have it because I get a lot of um, I get a lot of uh, salty messages <laughs> throughout the years. Um not good. And then when they get my phone number, then I block their numbers, and then I leave messages still. Yeah, I, I've gotten some serious uh, threats, so I usually stay off most of it for the most part. Um, yeah. It's too easy to get upset. But, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a little bit of pressure. But that's not, like I said, 10 years ago, I got in a horrible accident, and um, there's a chance I was never going to race again. They're going to amputate one of my hands. And ever since then, like I said, I've been a different human being um, about the racing. You, all, all you can do is the best you can, period. Yeah. I'll ask uh, the other two guys same same scenario um you know you've you've got to be able to take some criticism when you're, you're driving horses especially at the top level uh how do you handle that jd when you you know read something online or or hear something about a, a drive uh you know what it happens often enough but uh you can't really let it get to you and you got to move on to the next race regardless but uh it's definitely not the ideal thing to see Montreal, do you do you let that get under your skin, or do you just uh, turn the page? No, it doesn't get underneath my skin. Uh, I got a lot of the same thing. Get a lot of threats and racist stuff thrown at me, and the only person that it, it actually bothers is my dad. <laughs> he, he can't back away from a fight, so whoever talks bad about me, he definitely goes after him. Yeah, my dad too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aaron. Well, let's uh, let's have a look at the. Um, the winning drive uh, in year two when you hit the thousand uh, win plateau. So this was the historic uh, victory for you. First time ever that a driver has been able to reach that mark more than once. And uh, what do you remember about this particular drive on this night? Uh, I, <laughs> um, for Brian Long, he's a, he's a great friend of mine. And we kind of go back and forth and uh, with each other um, pretty often. And uh, just a little cheap horse, you know, I mean, here's, she was six to five, um, but, you know, probably not the best in the race. But I just drove her like typical Aaron Merriman, you know, um, worry about that last quarter a lot. I think it was like 34 and three or something like that. But um, <laughs> I just kind of like let her go, you know what I mean? Like very, very confident. I think I was having a decent day that day. And um, she was a little bumpy too. But once I turned, you know, got down the backside and I opened up a bunch. I know she's going to get tired, but, you know, it was very, very surreal. And I, I thought if she'd run or something like that, I'm cool because it was only November at some time, so I was going to have another month to get that win. Okay, so yeah, you had lots of time. You had a, a nice cushion there. And on a night like this, when <laughs> yeah. uh, you said you're in the zone and the confidence confidence is rolling, you just drive by instinct, basically? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so absent-minded a lot of times when I drive, um, you, you know, especially when you're driving the same track. And I think, like I said, these other drivers will say the same thing. You, you know the driver's tendencies. Um, you know a lot of the horses and things like that. Um, I don't know if Jonathan's ever been in Northfield, but Montreal has, and I mean it's just it's a fast track. It's uh, it just carries speed. It's it's perfect for a guy like me who's not afraid to make mistakes and overdrive one. It does uh, overcompensate my driving some, so um, I do definitely do like that. But you know me going to the Meadows definitely made me a better driver. Um, you know Dave Clone of course is there, um, great drivers, but the track doesn't carry speed yet. I have to you know. Definitely a lot more thinking and um, tripping horses out. So I think that's made me who I am today, actually, uh, is going to another track and, and experiencing exact opposite kind of racing I got to do. Yeah. 
And you mentioned Dave Pallone, and uh, you get a chance to drive with him now on a daily basis. And I'm sure you marvel at him, the winningest driver in harness racing history. Uh, 19,000 plus wins for him now. You think you'd have to think 20,000 is inevitable, uh, a number that uh, you know years ago would have been uh, hard to fathom, certainly. Uh, but you're yourself, you're closing in at 13,000. Uh, I think people would think if there's anybody that could give his numbers a threat, it might be a guy like you. Do you uh, even think that way at this point? No. <laughs> um, I really don't want to. Just like the thousand win thing, um, I just hate looking. Um, and like it, it's, it takes like it, that's also something I would always like look, 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 look all the time. And then finally, I just like, well, nothing's changing. Like you know, what I mean, I'm gonna do the same thing each day, day in and day out. And uh, Roger Houston, you know, he's not there anymore, but he's is a godsend to this business. Uh, believe me when I tell you. But and Montrell's had him call some great calls, and uh, you know, he would kind of keep me updated. And there's a guy on Twitter, you know, named Joe Fitzgerald, would kind of like let me know where I'm at. So there's no reason why I had to look, but. It's not something I think of. Um, as long as I'm feeling pretty good, like I think I can go not necessarily as much of a pace as I've been going, but because I think I want to shut down sooner or later, like just a little bit. Um, but I think as long as I can keep winning races, I'll, I'll uh, continue this, um, especially my son will be graduating next year. But I mean, I don't know. Dave, Dave's still pretty competitive, guys. I mean, I, he's like me. He's a cycle. I mean, like, I, mean I don't want to say it like that or whatever, but like, you got a guy, whether you like him or not, people don't hand you horse races. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, he's the, you hear that all the time. Well, he didn't drive in this race or didn't do this or whatever. Like, they don't hand you horse races, you know, and, and um, you still got to win them. You know, and it's, it's, I mean, like I said, it's it's tough. And, I mean, I don't know. I just want to be a nice guy, too. I want to be a nice guy, and I want to be known as nice to race with and um, and be very humble with no ego and uh, and help the people I drive for. That's that's my big yeah. thing. That's why I go with my every day. But, you know. Dave Plown is not stopping anytime soon, I don't think. So that's my guess. No, I don't think I don't think so either. Well, nice guys. We've got three of the the nicest in the business here with us tonight. Aaron Merriman, Montreal Teague, Jonathan Drury. Uh, thanking them again for joining us tonight. We've got another trivia question now to pass along. And if you've been listening closely tonight, we've already given you the answer. So uh, it'll be a little bit of a test as to how close you've been listening. Who was the second driver in history to record 1,000 plus wins in a single season. Walter Case was the first to do it in 98. Aaron, the fourth to do it, and the only multiple uh, time winner of more than 1,000 races. But who was the second to hit that impressive milestone? And again, leave your answers for us in the comments section. Well, the biggest race in Canada, no question, is the Pepsi North America Cup and Montreal Teague. Uh, you were uh, disappointed the first uh, time out with Wiggle It Jiggle It. Uh, it was another Delaware-based horse uh, that beat you that year. Wakazashi Hanover with a perfect pocket trip got you at the wire. But uh, that wasn't the case with Lather Up. Uh, uh, here you are celebrating with that Pepsi NA Cup trophy. And uh, what did it mean to you that night? It wasn't on your home turf, but to, to come north of the border and win our biggest race. What did it mean? Uh, it was definitely a redemption because I was pretty sour about having my having the chance to win it with Wiggles and him going with a undefeated record for 10 to 12 races and then it just come to a complete end finishing second in the North America Cup. So getting the opportunity to do it again with Lather Up and actually winning it this time was definitely redemption. Yeah. And, you know, that's a good word to use. Uh, it, being a young guy and, and uh, at the time you had Wiggle It, Jiggle It, you didn't have that many uh, tests and big races in the Grand Circuit. So there, there were those whispers out there. Can this young guy do it? And then uh, so to come back and, and kind of silence the critics with Lather Up, I mean, how good did that feel? It felt great because I literally went through that with Wiggles and Lather Up. Uh, it was always a talk that if Brian Sears, Yannick, Tim Tietrich, Aaron Merriman were driving the horse, that uh, he could do much better. So. You know, I mean, I, I proved them all wrong, and you know that that that, that was the best uh, best feeling. Yeah, lather up! Uh, excellent three-year-old season. It was a, a deep crop. Uh, they all kind of took turns over the course of the year, uh, but as a four-year-old lather up, I think, and, and especially a stretch <clears throat> of races in midsummer, uh, it was as good as I think I've ever seen an older pacer. Uh, 
would you concur? And we're talking about the stretch where he won the graduate, the Sam McKee. I mean, he was thoroughly dominant over the very best older Pacers in North America. Yeah, definitely by far. Uh, going after world record after world record and a mile and an eighth race to a mile and mile race uh, at the end of the night at Meadowlands going to 46 flat. So, um, yeah, he definitely went on a stretch that was unbelievable. I'd never seen it before that many times in a row. Yeah. And you talked about it, uh, the all-time speed record of 146. We're going to take a look back at that. Uh, that came in the graduate at the Meadowlands. Uh, going into the race, were there any thoughts of records, or was it just win the race and see what happens from there? Yeah, it was just late in the night, and um, the weather wasn't perfect, so literally just get away as close as possible and don't get locked in pretty much. And the trip really works out to, to perfection here, and uh, the end result is a world record performance. Here's Ken with the description. Fraction here. Done well fourth now. The downtown bus got away in fifth. On the outside, Jimmy Freight is looking to go up sixth, followed by Backstreet Shadow. And then at the back, we have Courtly Choice and uh, Think Big, Dream Big in American History. 25 and 3. How about that? It's always a Prince in front. Always a Prince by two is on the engine here with Sears. Trying to get a breather. Lather up in the second spot. This is the plan is third. Underway now, Jimmy Freight on the outside. Stride for stride with Dunwell on the rail. And then it's the downtown bus on the outside. American History shoots a gap followed by a backstreet shadow and then it's think big dream big and courtly choice half a dazzling 52 seconds always a prince pulling out all the stops here in front by a length and a quarter a dreamy two-hole ride for lather up in montreal teague as they head to three quarters on the inside, this is the plan now, is wedged in with Jimmy Freight stride for stride and looking for room. Done well on the inside, fifth, and they turn for home. Three quarters, one, 19, and one. Into the stretch, always a Prince looking to take them all the way. But it's Lather up on the outside. Lather up the perfect trip, trying to pay off. Montreal T going to work. Lather up on the inside, always a Prince can't go with him. And then this is the plan. It is Lather up, a perfect trip paid off in the graduate final, and Lather up is home in 146, equaling the all-time fastest mile in harness racing history. And a, a little fist pump at the end. Did, could you see immediately how fast you went? No, I had no idea until I actually got around the turn where the paddock is. If I didn't do the damn fist bump, I might have went 45 and 4. <laughs> well, speaking of that, that's our next question, and uh, it comes from uh, uh, J.D. Varnell writing in. Thank you to J.D. Uh, wanted to know, did you feel that Lather Up could have gone faster? Uh, again, not, not sure if you uh, were even thinking record at the three quarters, but do you think he could have gone a tick faster? Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, that, that horse is unbelievable. He can do it on the front. He can do it from off the pace. And the 2 old was going to be the perfect trip, so um, I, I think that trip worked out the best for me. I mean, if, if I wasn't going to be in a 2 old I was going to be on the front, and I probably wouldn't have went those fractions. Yeah. As good as he was there, Montrell, I thought he was even better in the Sam McKee in the added distance event. Uh, he went at, a, I think, a 146 and 3 clip for the mile, if I remember correctly, and he carved out the fractions himself. Uh, would you agree? I, I mean, I, I, that was a Herculean race. Yeah, that was unbelievable because I was literally just trying to rate the mile the whole time because I knew we had to go to an extra eight. And to see 46 and three and then uh, 159 and two pop up after, uh, definitely another world's record. So, yeah, I mean, I never gave him his head until the last eight going to 46 and three. Yeah, and you had horses like McWicked uh, chasing, and, and you were widening on them at the end. So, uh, yeah, what a, what a string of, uh, of four consecutive wins he put together. Maybe the best four-race stretch uh, we've ever seen from an older horse, or certainly right up there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with our guests here in uh, just a second, but uh, want to let you know of a couple of new initiatives. Uh, COSA teaming up with Ontario Racing for a brand-new promotion. It's a scratch and win promotion that will be starting soon. Freescratch.ca, your chance to play along for some fantastic prizes. Absolutely free to do so. And uh, you'll see this all over social media and, of course, all over those 
brand new trailer wraps that are going up and down the highways of Ontario and will be uh, much more so in the coming weeks. So uh, sign up for Free Scratch and play. Freescratch.ca to do so. Ontario Racing and COSA teaming up for that. And a new app just announced recently and a really uh, interesting uh, new project here. It's called Hoofbid, a new app that's uh, available on both Android and iOS devices, free to download on both Google Play or the App Store, a new way to sell horses online. Uh, interesting, uh, some of the interesting uh, things with this, it's fully integrated with the Trackit system, which uh, gives access to the Standard Bread Canada database and uh, provides you with the most up-to-date information available. Race videos can also be added, and they're building the database for that. Uh, the first sale on the Hoofbid platform is scheduled for next Sunday, May the 17th, and they're offering a free listing plus a video, if available, uh, for a $99 value, and that'll be free of charge for the first online auction. And uh, if you create your Hoofbit account during May, you'll automatically be entered for a chance to win $1,000. So some really exciting new things happening. And uh, check it out at hoofbid.com. We welcome you back to the show. And uh, we welcome again our special guests uh, this evening, Aaron Merriman, Montreal Teague, and Jonathan Drury. And Jonathan, uh, last year, no question for you, the big gun uh, was a three-year-old pacing filly by the name of Bodica. Uh, you picked her up, I believe, in her second start of the season for trainer Billy Budd. Uh, what were the circumstances behind uh, picking up the drive, first of all? Uh, she came out to be announced that night, and uh, he came up to me during the, one night during the week and said that uh, I got Philly for you to drive on whatever night it was, and uh, she won't get beat. And he was right. <laughs> There you go. Well, uh, the result was an eight-length win and an overnight. Um, what did you think you had after after winning that race? Uh, it was kind of windy that night, and uh, she went the biggest mile on the card, I think, and uh, she was very strong doing it. So going into the first goal, I was fairly confident in her. And, uh, well, you not only won that first gold, you would rattle off seven consecutive wins with her and uh, eight of 12 starts uh, the rest of the way in the campaign. So uh, good fortune to certainly to pick up uh, the drive of the Philly, but you made the most of the opportunities. Uh, set the stage, though, for the Super Final. Uh, this is a great crop of three-year-old Phillies. Powerful Chris in there, Sunny D. So this certainly wasn't uh, a walk in the park for your Philly, but how did you think your chances were going into the final? I was really confident in her. She won a very tough trip at Flamborough, being parked the whole way and just getting beaten 51. And uh, I trained her prior to this start in 52, home of 25 and change at Mohawk. And uh, she was really good. And I just figured, as dominant as she'd been on the bigger track, that I was going to be pretty tough to beat in there. And you certainly drive her like she's the best. Uh, here is what is ultimately the winning move. And uh, sitting third, did you feel like you had to do that? Uh, was this what you what you had wanted to do at the outset? Uh, I thought if I could get a Trevor early enough, he'd have to uh, turn me loose. And my filly's uh, really big and takes her a little bit of time to get rolling. So I figured if I could get her to the front and just let her keep marching, she'd be pretty tough to catch. Okay, here's Kenny Middleton with the call of the final quarter. So racy. She's backpedaling right now. In at the rail from in third is powerful Chris. Three wide off cover Summer Charm. Then at the rail is Ideation Hanover. Winding up is Betcha Baby. Lovely Dawn is going to be four wide coming out of the turn as they race to three quarters. The leader, Boudica. Sunny D, second at the inside. Powerful Chris, yet to catapult. Three quarters. One, 21 and one. And they come into the stretch. And it's Boudica still there. She's on top a length and a half. Sunny D on the outside from in second. Then it's powerful Powerful Chris, who came out flat-footed off that trip. Far outside is Ideation Hanover. Boudica digs in in deep stretch for Drury. And it's Boudica clear by four. The super final to Boudica. A powerful performance for Boudica to win. And she stops the clock in 1.49 and two. The Billy Bud pupil winning in 49 and two. And uh, yeah, the fractions, uh, Jonathan, not for the faint of heart, 53 and four, but it uh, looks like just a big grinding type filly that just keeps going. 
Yeah, she is. She can give you a 26 quarter any time, but it's usually the second eighth that uh, she's pacing the hardest. You know, it takes her a little bit to get going, and she could actually get you in trouble leaving because she couldn't really snap off the gate that handy. And uh, can you give us a status report on her? Have you been uh, been keeping up on what she's been up to? Actually, I was over and saw her yesterday, and uh, she looks like she grew, believe it or not. And um, they said she's been in 2-4 uh, over the farm in the jog cart and training back really well, so it should be uh, fun to see. Yeah, one we're looking forward to seeing uh, returning. Uh, no question about that. And uh, we've got another question now that we're going to get to. This one coming from Bridget Hawkins. And uh, her question has to do with superstition. Where or how does it play into the sport? For uh, We'll uh, ask all three gentlemen this one. She says, I know Aaron has or had a whip color preference. Is this still true? So we might as well start with you on that one. Yeah, it's still true. <laughs> um, no, I think when I was starting like my first 10 years of driving, I would only drive with a white whip. Um, my dad told me, oh, black whips are bad luck. And they really didn't make that many. Um, then I got in that wreck <laughs> because I almost died. So I thought I'm just gonna use black and I will not drive with a white whip, period, will not. So I'm, I'm black only and I just don't like white. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, Montrell, any, any superstitions? No, not that I can think of, no. JD? Uh, no, none that I can think of either. So I'm the only right, well, The only strange, <laughs> strange guy on the panel tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Bridget for that question. And uh, yeah, keep them coming. Uh, we've got time uh, to uh, work in a few more later in the show. Uh, you talked about your, your father, Aaron. Uh, Lanny's your, your father, correct? Yes. And that's, uh, is that who you learned your early lessons from? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, even to this day, um, you know, he wasn't necessarily a catch driver as trade. You know, he was a driver trainer, um, did catch drive, of course. You know, he's won 1,500 races or so and, um, you know, trained some, you know, good horses. And um, But just his uh, overall attitude and persona, um, I strive to be. He doesn't get rattled. You know, he doesn't get upset. Um, it took me a while to get that way or whatever. Like, I don't get upset uh, after horse races. I don't blame anybody else. It's just not, that's just not me. You know, you just everybody's out like i said do the best you can um a lot of people get a little bit of beefs here or there or whatever but i just pretty much ignore it and even if they have a beef with me i don't i just do it the best they can for that horse uh that race you know i don't really care about anything else but my dad's definitely uh every we talk every day multiple times a day and um if you see that i didn't have a good day at the meadow so calm he's like hey you know turn it up you know what i mean like no big deal you know which which it's not you know there's always tomorrow there's no there's another race you know until you retire so um i definitely uh take pride in uh, him being my father um i definitely not would be anywhere even close where i am without him hey, and jonathan uh, we heard aaron talk about the fact that he had to kind of learn to be a little more laid back you're a pretty laid back guy and uh but should we uh mistake that with uh not being competitive or would that be a mistake <clears throat> no that'd be a mistake i mean i'm very competitive, but I tried to stay laid back and get along with everybody the best I can. And uh, you also would have learned your early lessons from your father, uh, Barry. And uh, and uh, he, I think, uh, started out when he was younger with uh, Ronnie Waples. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, he still has a couple horses there. And uh, him and my mother go do them every day. And I spent most of my days growing up at the barn, actually. You know, whenever I wasn't in school, I was there. And that's kind of where I learned to get going. And I know you guys had the blue and yellow colors. Was that uh, something that you, you picked up from, from the time working with Ronnie? Um, I'm not sure um, if that's where he picked them up. But uh, I just stuck to kept my colors pretty much similar to my father's. Yeah. Montreal, same thing for you, right? Uh, you carried on the, the family colors? Clarks? Yeah, definitely carried on family colors. Just changed the T into a MT just to make it a little bit different, but not much change. Yeah. And I'll ask you the same thing too about uh, you know that being that ability to turn the page, like you say, and uh, you seem like a pretty laid back guy as well. Your father George, uh, real uh, amicable guy that uh, you know everybody likes, and has uh, that demeanor served uh, served you well in your career? 
Yeah, definitely. Just uh, learning from him, being him being my role model, just seeing how he uh, is perceived in the industry and everything like that. So I kind of want to be the same way and definitely don't want anybody hating me or disliking me. So I try to stay laid back and get along with everybody. And how are George and, and Brenda and Clive and everybody these days? Oh, we're all doing good. Um, still going to the barn every day and uh, see, her, see, her, see each other every day and Got a little fights here and there, but nothing, nothing major. For sure. So, well, Aaron, uh, as we we looked, uh, we're looking at some of the the highlights of horses like Wiggle It, Jiggle It, and Batting Line, and and uh, for all the races you win, we don't see as much of you on the Grand Circuit, and uh, you know, it's just something, right? You kind of have to focus on one or the other. Um, but is there is there a part of you that wants to be seen more in those types of races, or are you just happy with how things are right now? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty cool. But I I've drove a lot of grass. You know, I've had the opportunity to grab in the in the Oaks, um, in the Hamiltonian. Um, the Hamiltonian is probably like when that first thing come around. I can't be a homer and say the Little Brown Jug. I I would say the Hamiltonian is, is the best race car and race day there is. Um, I've had a lot of opportunities, you know. And usually I go and I'm chasing, you know what I mean. But um, I got checks in both those races. And uh, like I said, I'm chasing usually. But I've had the opportunity to drive a lot of Grand Circuit. Um, just never the best torch, you know, but I don't really ever think about it. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't bother me. Everybody's got a niche in this business, you know what I mean? And, and I'm very, very happy where mine is, you know, uh, I mean, I love where I live. Um, I love Ohio. Um, I stuck it out here when it was bad. Uh, when I had opportunities to go, you know, I said, ah, well, you know, I had to think of my, you know, children first or my, you know, my child that lived with me first. And, um, this was the best opportunity and, uh, best place to, you know, to raise him. So, um, I, I will never regret not going anywhere else. I will never regret it. Um, I'm very, very happy where I am. And, uh, hey, you're making a pretty good living, too. Uh, you topped uh, the $10 million mark in earnings in 2018. So uh, you're certainly up at uh, up in the upper echelons when it comes to that as well. And, uh, you know, you get to drive uh, many great race horses. And, and the quality of horses at Northfield, especially in the last uh, three or four years, is is very impressive. Uh, one of the hard-hitting horses that you've been behind many times and, uh, in fact, uh, turned into one sub-150 mile a couple of times you've driven him is Bully Pulpit. Um, maybe just a, a thought on, on this campaigner. and He often has to bang heads with the, another great old warrior in Southwind Amazon. Yeah, he, he, good horse. I mean, um, almost like the, you know, the, the, the Rodisha horse that uh, Drury drives. Um, doesn't do anything super quick getting out of there, but like there's like no bottom. You know, he's kind of a bigger thing. Um, it, you know, Loney's done a, an unbelievable job, and this horse was just meant for a half mile um, as a South and Amazon. I mean, Northfield like last year, I think for sure, and I even had another horse I drove, uh, Major Nemesis for Bill Mercury. I, our open was going, I mean, sub 50, I mean, every week. I mean, on a half mile track, is it's unheard of, you know, and um, <laughs> you got the same three, four, and five horses that are battling at every, you know, every single start, but. Um, Boy, Pulpit's, uh, he loved it. He just loves being on the outside, loves racing horses. You know what I mean? Like, he, he doesn't leave fast, but, I mean, he's, he really likes his work, that's for sure. And I think Curtis was able to pull the replay of that one, so we're going to have a look at that. And, uh, yeah, I, I love watching uh, the top class at Northfield every week. Uh, they're Warriors and um, – Amazon, Bully Pulpit, those horses always get handicapped at the outside spot. You've got the eight hole here on a half mile track. And uh, this particular race, um, I guess the trip really is about as good as you, you can get, right, from the eight hole? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you leave and you get a kind of a spot up there. Um, I see Chris Page, you know, let me in. He's probably using me to follow, but he's a great guy to drive with. Um, you know, there's some good drivers. There's good drivers everywhere, but there's but he's a very, very good driver, very good to drive with. Um, you know, I got him for a few steps. He got to see the helmet, but his his thing is, you know, tracking and trying to beat horses. Um, he was very, very lazy when he got him. And, um, you know, change is just as good as anything, to, in my opinion, with some horses. And I think getting this horse in a half mile where he can pace it equally as fast as any other size track is, is really what helped. But, I mean, he got to tuck in behind this horse here coming up, and I mean, just braving him up. And, I mean, there's a half and 53 and two. <laughs> but that's the kind of fractions I like for some reason. I like speed. I don't want to finesse it, but like I was all right, all well, I could here. 
Yeah, and Southwind Amazon, you've got to try and reel him in. Another good guy with the race call, Dave B. and Coney was in the announcer's booth on this night. Moving up in fourth now comes uh, Barnabas, also three wide stride of pride. Three quarters, 120 and four, and it's a race. Southwind Amazon inside. Here comes Bully Pulpit outside. These two are going to duke it out, and we're going to see a sub 150 mile tonight, folks. Southwind Amazon inside, but Bully Pulpit is at his throat at the top of the stretch. Bully Pulpit on the outside has the lead. Southwind Amazon battling back. Bully Pulpit from the assigned eight hole wins it in 149 and four. Southwind Amazon second, Uta Shark looked like he was third. What a race. So Aaron, uh, from the time you would have started driving till now, can, can you believe it that you're going 49 miles at Northfield on a weeknight? It's incredible. No, no, I cannot. Um, I actually packed my bags immediately when I got my license and moved to uh, Toledo Raceway Park. Um, pretty much got a wheelbarrow, a job cart, and a horse to train for my dad um, and went to work for somebody. And, you know, I mean, I, if I was going to be a driver, I was going to be, you know, I started on, you know, cheaper horses. And um, and I actually, like I said, I pride myself in it. I, I pride myself in, in actually working, you know, my way up and, and not being just, uh, oh, I, I got my license or whatever. I got 12 qualifiers. I got my, you know got to drive i'm i'm very very happy with my upbringing and and how i've come along um toledo's taught me how to wreck taught me how to fall <laughs> unfortunately but um it really really like i said it, it helped me when you get the opportunity to drive a lot of horses and experiences everything you know i'm learning every single day and i i try to help out you know the younger guys whatever when they come to talk to me whatever like i try to tell them you got to take criticism you got to do you know i mean you, you got to drive the bad ones and you, you got to drive the bad ones like they're bad horses not like they're good horses and um some kids get it some kids don't you know and uh i mean there's a couple of kids uh, brady brown races the meadows i think he's got a bright future ahead of him he's he's very very sharp he's a very smart kid um i'm very very proud of way is way he is but i mean yeah i, I don't know nope. but i, I want to add something to lather up um just because i know he was fast in 46 but the, when he went at hoosier and he did everything but lay down on the last turn for a horse <laughs> to come back and, and like you know I mean, get his feet underneath him and Montreal had him in a full Nelson when he come up the passing when the horses got around him and he just paced by those horses. You just don't see, you don't see that happen yeah. with it, with good horses. I mean, you just don't see it like that. You to be as resilient enough to, you know what I mean, like to be all discombobulated and then just be at your best in the stretch. I just, I just never see anything like it. You know, <laughs> to have a horse just completely fall apart and come back and do it. It's unbelievable. And also to help that yeah. trivia question of the second guy, thousand. Uh, Mark Sundstrom was a trainer, and Eden Rock was the horse. If anybody wants to know, that's going to be the answer to the question. There you go, <clears throat> a little bonus hint. Um, we'll ask, uh, I think, all of you guys this uh, question, and maybe we'll start with Jonathan and work our way around. Who, uh, who, maybe even today, or at least when you were starting out, who were drivers, or was there a particular driver that you really looked up to and thought, man, that guy, that guy's. Uh, great and that's where i want to be uh i'm always watching guys like tim tetrick and brian sears you know there's so much you can learn from a guy like that and uh i would say probably timmy when i first started out yeah montrell same question uh first starting out the big name was john campbell i was looking at him more than anybody until i started driving and actually went against ron pierce <laughs> I mean, he could take a horse that I couldn't make go and win with him next week. And since he retired, I've been looking at Tim T-shirt too. Yeah. And Aaron, what about you? Um, David Miller. Um, just, I just, I mean, I'll pound for pound any kind of horse. I think he's, I, I think he's the best. I think he's probably one of the, probably the best that's ever put on a set of colors. Um, I've driven just so many horses. He Just the way he can, he'll drive a cheap horse the same will drive a stake race. I, I think that makes a big difference. And, even to this day, he still goes to tracks and, and he will drive, you know what I mean, the cheaper races. And I, I respect drivers for that. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. I, I don't, it kind of like bothers me a little bit sometimes when you get to that level, or whatever, where you think that you're too good to drive um, overnights. It, it bothers me a little bit. Um, overnights are where you got where you're at. And I, I think that you can, I mean, people say accident, you can get an accident driving a good horse or you can get an accident driving a bad horse. It doesn't, I don't think it makes any difference at all. Um, but David Miller, I think, is pound for pound the best driver and most consistent I've ever probably seen. Yeah. 
And you mentioned a, a young guy to, to be watching is Brady Brown. And yeah, we see him at uh, the Meadows doing well. Montreal and Jonathan, we'll ask you, uh, you guys are relatively young yourselves, but uh, is there a young guy that, that you've seen starting out that you think uh, has a lot of potential in the business? Montreal, start with you on that one. Uh, you know, I haven't really followed anybody except for the immediate people at where I'm at Dover Downs and Harrington and stuff like that. But uh, I would I would say Drew Monty maybe. Uh, I got to know him when I was racing at Meadowlands, and he seems like a really nice kid. Yeah. yeah. And Jonathan, anybody in Ontario that we should uh, really be keeping our eye on? Yeah, someone that you'd actually be familiar with down at the uh, Western Fair there, uh, Daryl Thiessen. He came up from uh, out west. He was fighting bulls, and he came up here and started working for us there at the farm. And uh, he handles the horse really well on the track, and I think he's got a bright future. And, and uh, there's a great question, right? How do you go from fighting bulls <clears throat> to driving racehorses? <laughs> I think that Jason Thompson guy did, didn't he, Montreal? That's right. <laughs> 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 yeah, I guess I you need good hands awesome. for both. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we we had a look at uh, <clears throat> a hard hitting old horse named Bully Pulpit a moment ago, and uh, Jonathan, you drive uh, a similar type horse regularly at uh, Mohawk Park. Uh, just a class veteran horse. His name is Physically Inclined. Uh, we're going to get a look at uh, a photo of him. Big beautiful son of Mach Three. Um, I think one a division of the Sun Beach somewhere, I believe, uh, as a three-year-old and, uh, or maybe an NA Cup elimination. I'd have to go back and look at it. Uh, and it uh, really has blossomed into a, a great old campaigner. Uh, how much fun is it to sit up behind him week in and week out in the preferred? Yeah, he's a nice horse to drive. You know, he's another one that's not overly handy getting away from the gate, but once he, if you can get him there, he'll keep going all day. You know, he gives you everything he's got. And uh, you drive him for Carmen Osiello, as you mentioned. Uh, you're, you're kind of the regular pilot for that operation. And uh, you put the lifetime mark on on this guy, a 49 and two. We're going to take a look back at that race. Uh, do you recall that this particular race uh, versus others? Not really, no. <laughs> well, that's him. He's getting away uh, in fifth position at this point. And uh, I think you're going to come first up around the halfway point. But we'll let Ken Middleton describe the action. This is a look at the, the veteran physically inclined. Back into third is Tresser Hanover. Then P.L. Jackson, physically inclined, wants to roll, but Jory says not yet. He sits from fifth. 25 and four, first quarter smoke show. Back there from sixth, Regal Sun. Then off the speed is Maroma Beach, followed by American Hustle. And race trailer is it Friday yet. They're at three eights. Now physically inclined gets the green light as Jury swings him to the outside and says go. Physically inclined getting into gear as he gobbles up racetrack and picks up positions on the way to the midway point. McNair senses the pressure. He sees it's physically inclined. Who's right up alongside. They're down to the half and 55 flat and getting some front end respect is physically inclined. As Go West Go Fast releases him to catch cover of the favorite. Third outside now to Regal Sun. Back inside from in fourth as they travel to turn is Nirvana Sealster. Then moving up on the cover outside from in fifth is Maroma Beach. Six trapped in. Trasser Hanover seven to the outside. Travels American Hustle now. Further back at the rail is P.L. Jackson who got that final turn shuffle and outside to trailer is it Friday yet three quarters of 122 and two five in four out as they swing for home and it's physically inclined his wheel disc along by Drury trying to keep him alive for the final eighth of the mile here from the pocket spot comes go west go fast Nirvana Seelster's got clearance and he sets his sights on tempo setter physically inclined physically inclined is still there here's Nirvana Seelster with one leg push physically inclined shrugs him off Nirvana Seelster, second American Hustle, third, 149 and two for physically inclined. Yeah, real good on this night, and uh, and just a just a pleasure to watch a race. Uh, there he is, great looking animal, isn't he, JD? When you see him in in person. Yeah, he sure is. He's a uh, he's a really big horse, actually. And, uh, and just as good, I, th I think, is he not on, on a half or certainly handles a half or a smaller track well for a big horse? I've only ever uh, drove him at Mohawk, so I 
really couldn't tell you. Uh, that was a question I think that we had. Uh, we'll ask you while we're on the topic, guys. The the difference between driving on the different size tracks. Aaron uh, is a guy that drives on a on a five eighths and a half mile daily, um, and then you know obviously on the bigger tracks. Uh, what are the differences, or is there much of a difference in the way you approach the races? Um, yeah, I'm definitely like I said. Um, every track's different. I think all the track surfaces are different. Um, so. I mean, on a bigger track, you can definitely be more patient. Um, I don't drive a, not, a lot on a big track, and I don't have a ton of experience on there, but I usually go to Hoosier some every year a little bit. Um, like I said, I've been to the Meadowlands and drove. I've been up, you know, to Jonathan's area as well. I mean, you just got to – you can be a lot more patient there. You know, aggressiveness is not needed. You know, but, you know, I think the smaller the track position means a lot more, um, and, and you got to be aggressive, uh, you know, and that's pretty much, I guess, is my driving style is, is aggressive, so – that's why I pretty much stay where I'm at. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't, I, I like to go down burning, you know. <laughs> and Montreal, uh, in your neck of the woods, uh, you drive uh, part of the season at Harrington, part of the, the season at Dover. You have a preference uh, between the two? Uh, just location would probably be Harrington. That's, that's really the home track. Five minutes away from my house. Uh, better atmosphere, better people. Overall, better, better facility. But um, I'd, rather, I'd rather race on a half, too. Yeah. And, Jonathan, uh, you know, you're driving primarily now Mohawk, but uh, plenty of experience on the half-mile ovals in Ontario as well. Uh, what do you find the big difference is between the smaller versus the bigger ovals? I think just the racing style, like Aaron was saying, you know, you're more aggressive on the half-mile track, where on the bigger track you can have more patience and uh, race them either which way. All right, we've got uh, that poll question that we want to have another look at and uh, give you some more time to give us your answer for that. Uh, right off the top tonight, we asked you, as we look forward to the return of some of these big event days in racing, which one do you think annually produces the best card of racing? Is it the Little Brown Jug? Is it the Pepsi North America Cup, the Hamiltonian, or the Breeders' Crown? They're four of the most anticipated days on the racing calendar each and every year, which one do you think produces the best card of racing annually? And still time, uh, if you have a question to pass along, do so in our comment section. We'll try and get to a few more of those. Uh, Montrell, in terms of uh, racing down in your neck of the woods, uh, you get to cross paths with a young lady named Heather Vitali quite often, and she is uh, certainly one of the, the big personalities in the sport, and she does a great job of covering racing down there. I want to ask you if you remember this. We're going to roll tape here in a minute. Uh, you did a little spoof on a Snickers commercial that uh, produced a video <laughs> that uh, was very popular. Uh, who who was uh, who was the brains behind that? Behind that? Oh, it was def definitely Heather. Uh, she just had me and asked if I had an extra set of colors upstairs, and we just got it done. And then you had a, a little guest part in the in the spot too. That too. Yeah, yeah, a little guest, too. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. She did a great job with it, and it turned out good. We could have it on TV yeah. in a commercial. Yeah, yeah, I remember watching it, and, and it was fantastic. I mean, it was exactly like uh, the actual Snickers commercials. So for those of you who haven't seen this, let's uh, give you a look back at uh, Montrell's brief acting career. Oh, my God, I can't believe this. What's wrong with these guys tonight? Really, I'm on a six-to-five shot, and I'm going to get parked? Here, Montreal, eat a Snickers. Why? Because you're just not yourself when you're hungry. Better? Yeah, better. You're not you when you're hungry. Snickers satisfies. <laughs> That's well done. <laughs> How did it feel to be uh, uh -huh. have your 15 minutes of fame? It was good. I got a lot of Snickers jokes after that, and everybody said, if you're, if you're mad, I'll grab you a Snickers, and I definitely took them. Well, you know, uh, I think you even uh, you one-upped that uh, with a, a guest appearance with a very famous gentleman named Regis Philbin. Uh, tell us the story behind that, uh, how that all happened. Dad had a shadow play Colt that uh, somebody contacted him birthday gift that was going to be out of the ordinary, and he asked Dad if he had any horses that he could rename them Regis the Horse. 
and that was the one that he picked, Regis Thor, so it was a shadow play Colt. So him got in touch with uh, Heather Vitale. She set up everything up. We made it to New York. I had my race bike on the back of the truck, went there, and we did a little skit with Regis uh, trying to figure out what it was. <laughs> well, you know what? We've well, got a video of this, too. Video. Let's have a look at uh, this. And uh, this is quite interesting. It's called Reach for the Star, and uh, we'll throw it to the audio. And had to figure out the sports celebrity in front of them. And boy, were they surprised. No. Other way, Georgie, that's Regis. <laughs> is that Regis? This is Regis. And this is a piece of steel. What's that? What's that? What is this? Oh, oh, hurt myself. <laughs> it's, it's not Regis, though. Oh, where is this person? <laughs> is that Regis? Here, here it is, over here. <laughs> oh, 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 hey now. This is scary. Regis, why do they have a whip Seven in that? seconds, seven seconds. Oh. Again. Who is it? Costa, naked again. No. <laughs> Regis. Uh, Harry Truman. I don't know. Take off your blindfolds. It's Montreal Teague, the driver of Regis the Horse. Oh! Oh! Yay! It was a hysterical segment. And uh, that looked like it could have been a bit traumatic for you, Montreal. Yeah, it was supposed to be Regis reaching for the stars, but he was reaching for something else. <laughs> uh, classic good stuff but uh you know that's one of the great things i guess right and uh racing top horses and uh, being associated with uh with uh, people like that it's pretty incredible i can't you hear. had uh, an association as well with some uh nfl players correct uh, as part of your ownership group over the years I think Dad had a horse with uh, Wayne Corbett and uh, Demario Williams. He also had a horse with George Foreman. So we, we wow. got some A-list celebrities around there. Did you get a free for, uh, Foreman uh, grill out of it? Ah, <laughs> uh, no. Now that you say we should have asked, but we already had one. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I think we've got um, another trivia – sorry, another question, actually, from our – Audience, all right, here we go. Shannon Sugar Doyle, the voice of the raceway at Western Fair District with the question. Montrell and Aaron have won some nice half-mile track races in the U.S. Is there a half-mile track race in Canada that they would like to win? That's a good one. And uh, Aaron, let's start with you. Um, uh, Yeah, the Molson at Western <laughs> Fair, right? Or is it called the Molson uh, still? Yeah, <clears throat> it's Cam Camlock Classic now. Now it's the Camelot Classic. Day. That race, yes. Um, a friend of mine works there. Um, I'd like to come up there and and, and race in it. Like, really, I would. Um, I, a couple times I was almost going to come, but then I didn't. So it's about time I do. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, it's a great race, and uh, it's, I think, the week, typically the week before the Battle of Lake Erie. And, uh, yeah. unfortunately, both events uh, – canceled for this year due to the COVID-19. So uh, Yeah, I was just going to piggyback them and uh, win, win that and then come down and win the Battle Lake Erie too. So it'll be kind of a cool double. Yeah, and we've had uh, some horses from down that way. I think Southwind Amazon was here uh, last year for that. Uh, Montrell, what about you? Uh, have you got a big race in Harrington, the Quilla Memorial that goes every year? Is there uh, one in Canada that uh, you'd like to race on on a half mile? Uh, yeah, I raced at the Prix de Prix uh, one time with Wiggles and he Pulled up sick, uh, finished second. Um, I wouldn't have no problem winning that. I, I would like to win that one. Absolutely. And, uh, of course, the uh, Confederation Cup is a big race here as well at Flamborough Downs for the four-year-olds. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, become a, a real staple in the calendar as well. I believe that's going to be pushed back uh, to the fall this year with the, the cancellations. Um, again, I think we've got uh, time for a few more questions as we uh, – Get along here to the nine o'clock mark and uh, we've spent about an hour and a half and it's really flown by uh, with these gentlemen um maybe just talk about a horse this year that you're you're really looking forward to getting reunited with uh aaron let's start with you oh um 
Uh, um, Blue Ivy, well, she's a four-year-old uh, breaker purchaser off of Chris Oaks. Um, she's already raced a couple times this year. I think you, you've got her in the breeder's crown and something else, but she's uh, she's winning absolutely under wraps last, the first few starts. And then um, Tika Mora, she was a two-year-old trot and play last year. She won the um, Sire Stake final just a little. I'm hoping she kind of grew a little bit. I thought being smaller might have hurt her a little bit, but she raced tough. And then uh, Bob McTuss, only take cash. She's up, um, you know, she's four now, but she was a dream to drive. But, like, I just kind of want to be start racing. <laughs> I don't care who I drive. <laughs> And Montrell, what about you? No, I guess the easy answer would be Wiggle Jiglet. But uh, there's a couple other ones that I look forward to. Definitely him. I have a horse that uh, did really good for me, Goldberg. He's been really good at Dover until they, uh, unfortunately, they closed. And also, Brenda has a really nice trotter. She's on a cruise. So we, I finally got a good trotter to drive. <laughs> yeah. And Jonathan, uh and I know there's a, a bit of a tie-in with you and, and the Teagues. Uh, I believe Southwind Lynx spent some time in your your stable uh, when he raced up here in the past. And uh, you drove a colt named uh, Diamir, I believe, in a Confederation Cup elimination a few years back. Uh, but uh, looking at this year, do you have uh, is there one particular horse you really really amped up to get back up behind? Yeah, I definitely have to see say Bo to see you know after the year she had last year. It's, uh be nice to see what she can do up against the uh, older horses absolutely uh and maybe let's talk about uh we've talked about drivers you've looked up to and uh, maybe some influences but maybe talk about someone that's uh, really tough to drive against a, a real tough competitor on the racetrack uh aaron uh, i know you ronnie wren uh, have some great battles is there is there someone else maybe besides ronnie kind of an obvious uh, pick that's a really maybe underrated tough driver at Northfield. Uh, Ron, yeah, Ronnie's tough. I mean, believe me, I tell you, Ronnie's tough. Um, Ryan Stahl, um, he, he's always he knows where to be. He's um, he's smart. He's you know what I mean. Like he doesn't over race horses. He's he's tough. I mean, he's tricky. You know what I mean. Sometimes he's um, <laughs> he always knows where to be. You know what I mean. He always puts himself in the right spot. Um, you don't want him close to you sometimes because this horse is probably good enough to beat you. And, and that's why I said, like, you want to get away from him. But um, I've been friends with him a long time. And uh, we have and we actually both started at Raceway Park. So uh, we've kind of kind of come up together. Um, you know, he, he trains a lot. And, you, you know, I mean, his, he catch drives a lot. But, you know, he doesn't focus on it as much as I always tell him he should. Um, but, I mean, he does good, you know. And, like, he's right up there. And believe me when I tell you, you know, and we got added Chris Lems. You know, he was leading driver out there a couple of New York tracks, last, you know, a couple of years ago, and it's a, it's a good cup call. And he's, you know, I mean, like you got guys that can be leading tracks. So the drivers, a lot of tracks, and the meadows you have leading drivers there, you know. And like I said, you're only as good as the horse you drive, anyway. I mean, I, I mean, I've learned that. I mean, I drive a lot of races, and uh, you put me on a good one, be on a good one, like just like Montreal said. I would, he got along with Wiggle Jiglet and lathered up. I, why would anybody else ever want anybody else to drive the horse? You know what I mean? He did a phenomenal job. Um, there's a lot of great drivers. Montreal's never you know, and not done something, you know what I mean? And I just don't, you know, I like, I'll tell you, like he's, he feels he's capable. And, but I mean, the guy that I would have to say is like tough to, you know what I mean? You got to always kind of watch for is Ryan Stahl. Like I said, he can put a worse horse sometimes in a really good position and then it's, and sneak up on you. Yeah. And Montrell, uh, at Harrington, you, you would uh, be facing a guy who's uh, the second winningest driver in harness history, Tony Morgan on a regular basis. Um, that's a name that uh, you know certainly jumps out at me. But who's the uh, who's the maybe the the guy there that you know maybe doesn't get the national recognition, but is a real top driver? Uh, you know what? I would have to throw my good friend Brick to Kirby's name in. He's done an amazing job. He's traveled a lot. He's got a lot of uh, talent with Jim King's horses, and he gets thrown a lot of good horses, but he he doesn't really have he doesn't get his name out there like he should. I mean. He, goes to the Meadowlands uh, on the nights that everybody isn't there and he puts in the work. So definitely Victor Kirby. And JD, uh, you're driving against the best in, in the nation uh, night in, night out at Mohawk. Uh, is there, there someone there that you, you really, you know, particularly have a, a lot of respect for as a driver? You know what? That's a really tough group of guys and uh, it, you couldn't name just one, you know, I, I got a ton of respect for everybody there. And, uh, I wouldn't say you could narrow it down to just one guy that's considerably tougher than a re the, another one, you know? Yeah. 
uh, and it's it's a competitive game, right? Uh, you know, and well, it, it, be racist. <laughs> Go ahead. Sounds like is that as, as political as you can get? <laughs> the election is coming up here in <laughs> November. If you want to come run? <laughs> I like everybody, but I was like, oh, is everybody yeah. the same? <laughs> Just throw a name out there. Well, that, yeah, it leads me to my next question. Um, you know, as competitive as it can get and probably get heated sometimes out on the racetrack. And, and you get into a race, Jonathan, where, uh, you know, a guy does something, you know, parks you or something that you didn't expect or didn't anticipate or, or vice versa. Um, you know, how heated can it get to, between guys out on the track? Uh, that varies between people but uh it can get uh, it can get pretty fired up there you know i try my best just to walk away and not have to deal with it right there and hope kind of cool down but uh some people can get right into it yeah you see you see that sometimes uh, montreal you'll see it like in the race you can tell two guys are, are talking to each other um you know is it is there an actual conversation happening at that point when when something like that goes on when you see two guys that are actually yelling on the race bikes you want to race out there and see what they're talking about and be the first one back in to, to walk next to them, see what's going to go on. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely right in the mix, but I try not to be one of those two guys. Yeah. And what about you, Aaron? The, the time well, you just have to plug yeah. your ears and pretend you didn't hear? Oh, I just sit back I just sit back and watch. I and, I, and any other time, I did lose my cool one time this year. I'm not going to say with who, um, but it's just a younger guy, and he's just got no respect. Like um, – at all and he tries to toss people around and he just caught me at the wrong moment and called me some uh pretty nasty words so i just kind of pretty much try to put him in his place but that's like greg grismore actually was behind me um he said he's never and he's raced me for so long he's never seen me angry nonetheless that angry ever in his life i don't ever i just let it go i but i'm telling you what there's some serious action <laughs> especially on a half i mean <laughs> And you get the same guys and you race all year round. Like, yeah, there's some animosity. I kind of enjoy it, it sometimes. And, you know, and I, I like to benefit from it. <laughs> uh, but having said that, I'm sure guys have, most guys have the ability to turn the page. And, uh, and uh, for the most part, uh, pretty tight knit group. Yeah, very. Yeah, it's it's pretty much a tight knit group. Yes. And, and like I said, you get the same guys. And, you know, some guys don't like each other or whatever, but in my opinion, it's very, very unprofessional to take it out on the racetrack anyway. Um, you're driving for somebody 95% of the time if you're a catch driver. Um, you, you need to keep your cool and, and drive that horse for that race like and do the best you can. I mean, you should be using you know, other people's horses to, you know, help your grudge or whatever you have against somebody. I, I, I think it's unfair. People do this you know, as, as well as we do for a living. Um, let it go. Be upset. You know what I mean? Leave it on the track and go home. Okay, I think we've got another question to pass along. And uh, this one coming from Dakota Jackson. This question going for all three drivers. What's the favorite race that you've driven in so far in your career? So maybe we'll ask uh, all of you uh, a favorite race that you have driven in and maybe one race that's on your bucket list, a race that you really want to drive in. Uh, JD, start with you on that one. Uh, I had an opportunity to actually drive in the Maple Leaf Trot, and so I'd say that's probably right up there for races that I've drove in, but uh, it'd be awesome to drive in the North America Cup. And Aaron, same uh, same question to you. Uh, oh, the Hamiltonian uh, is the best race I've ever driven. I finished fourth out of the nine hole. I was a long shot. Um, just the atmosphere, you're signing people's programs, you know what I mean, just the memorabilia part. Um, and I'd like to actually participate you know, it's something overseas. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really get upset about things. Um, I'm a little bit uh, upset now that to be rep representing the USA, we've had some non-All-Americans also representing the U.S. Um, to go drive in other countries. I'm a little bit, uh, I feel like I'm kind of a slap in the face. I must live in the wrong jurisdiction, but you got a guy, the leading dash guy, I mean, top 10 in wins, top five in the URS, and he doesn't even get a acknowledgement to go drive for the usa which is absolutely very very disappointing so you're so, saying you'd like to there. go <laughs> okay yeah i yeah i just but All i think right. it's um i mean I, it's, well, uh, I, it's politics <laughs> maybe if they don't the powers like right here if the powers that be are watching 
you heard it here. Aaron Merriman is, is ready to go and don the red, white, and blue. Uh, Montreal, what about you? Is there a particular race on your, your bucket list? Yeah, the, the main one was the Little Brown Jug, and I got lucky to, to win that one. But um, I've been in the British Crown twice and finished second both times, so I'm looking for a redemption for that, and definitely anybody has the bucket list of the Hamiltonian. But it, it's always hard to get that one trotter. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Um, and someone asked earlier, and uh, you just reminded me of that, uh, about uh, your father taking three horses a few years back to Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, to the uh, the Gold Cup and Saucer. Did uh, if you, you talked to your father about uh, that experience, what he, what he thought of it, and uh, it was great of him to take uh, three horses up there, one for each of uh, three elimination races that year. Yeah, he loved it. He thought it was a great presentation. Um, everybody put on the show, and he, he, he said it was like nothing you would ever see before. All the lights go out, the, the uh, spotlight on every horse. They, they definitely do it upright, and I've been trying to talk them into sending me every, uh, every year now. You're right. Well, there you I've go. heard nothing but good things about that. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, I think you'd uh, you'd thoroughly enjoy that for sure. Another question, this one from Blaine Anderson. Uh, Blaine, are the drivers doing anything specific to keep sharp as we approach a restart of racing? Good question. Uh, JD? Well, I'm at the barn every morning and out training horses every day, so I guess that's probably as close as you can get to racing at this point. And the fact that you're you're doing that regularly, even when live racing's happening, do you feel that uh, that being hands on in the mornings helps you at night? I think so. I think it helps keeps helps keep you a little bit sharper, you know. And uh, nothing uh, nothing gets be- makes it better than practice. Aaron, you said you were purging your laundry and a few other things, uh, but anything else you're doing to stay sharp? <laughs> no, no, I just go out like I haven't gone out to train. Um, and jog some for, like I said, for Billy Rhodes, the trainer. Um, I mean, I, I, it's definitely, I guess, to say sharp because I didn't do anything for a few weeks. And then I went out there and my arms were burning, like, legit, like, from not doing anything because you use such different muscles. That's why you'll see big, strong guys and they'll come jog a horse. They can't hold them, like, legit, like, you use different muscles. So that is. But, you know, like, I, like I said, it, this might be a blessing in a way. Um, give me a little bit of a break and a refreshment. Um, you know, ideally, my love and, uh, you know, persistence will – will keep me the same way as I was, but I'm, um, I guess, you know, just getting out there and being around horses. I love the horses a lot. So, um, I think that's probably something I'll probably do later on in my life is maybe just train a couple, but like my dad's got some babies, like, you know, go trips with them and train some fast. I've been going to the race bike with Billy's. So that's, that's about it. I guess if you want to call that sharp. Yeah. And you know, there, you, you hit on something else. You talk about these animals, they're, they're thousand pound animals. Uh, they're a lot stronger than we are. And when you get in a, in a race situation, maybe I'll throw this one at Montreal, where you get a horse, and you don't see it too often anymore, but, um, you know, a horse that really likes to pull, and, and uh, if you get caught in and get yourself in a bad spot, I mean, how scary is that? Uh, describe that for someone that's uh, never sat behind a horse. I've definitely been in a position like that a lot with Dad's horses because he likes them revved up, ready to roll. Don't grab into them. Just let them do what they're, what they're trying to do. Um it could be a scary situation if you're locked in and you, there's nowhere to go. You're looking at pylons to be the best option. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, there's no uh, no actual hub rail uh, on the inside anymore at this point in time. Uh, Aaron, yourself, uh, I'm sure you've been caught in that situation. Uh, not a nice feeling. Oh, yeah. Not very often, but I think it may be in this year or whatever, but like, I try to forget that kind of thing. Um, I think I had a bail out. Like, <laughs> I got a bail. I had to go left. <laughs> And I'm telling you, it's, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I like, um, it's embarrassing. Cause that's usually what you want something to happen to somebody else. So you can laugh at them when they come back in the driver's room. You know what I mean? And then pull up the replay, you know what I mean? Like five minutes later, <laughs> but when it happens to you, it's, it's not that fun at all, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's not a good feeling. Like they're much stronger than us and any horse is capable of doing it. That's, that's the crazy thing about it. Um, but you know, for the most part, surprisingly, I'm under somewhat control. <laughs> And JD, uh, maybe the the reverse of that, a horse that is lazy, and you've got to work at them uh, the whole race. Uh, bit of a workout for you. Yeah, it is. Uh, I much rather the more aggressive ones. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of like steer them better. and let, let them do their thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Is there uh, a particular breed of horse that uh, 
you can think of that that's lazy. Uh, you don't see it too often anymore, but uh, there occasionally is a is a, a sire that'll stamp a horse that's a, a little bit on well the lazy said. side. Is that that one? Yeah. yeah. Well said. I have to agree with Aaron on that. Yeah. And uh, you gotta like make and, them do their uh, work. Sometimes they're not lazy, but you gotta make them do it. Yeah. And what about uh, you know speaking of urging, uh, difference in the, in the whipping rule now uh, between Canada and uh, jurisdictions in the U.S. and uh, how do you navigate that when you move around? Or, or maybe I guess you haven't been driving that much in Canada, Aaron, in, in recent years. But uh, JD, for for you now when you go stateside, uh, how do you get your mindset ready when you're going back to a, a different rule? Yeah, sometimes you forget that you can actually hit them there until you get, uh, depending on where you are, you know how much you can get after one. But uh, sometimes you're so used to just picking away at them up here that uh, it takes you a race or two to remember that you can actually get after them a little bit more down there. And, uh, you know, opinions were, were really split when uh, when the rule came in here in Ontario. And uh, just talk about, I mean, it's been in place now for a number of years. Uh, do you even think about it now? Do you think it's had any real impact? Uh, I'm not real sure. I mean, it's very, very easy to get a little bit carried away, though, sometimes, you know, and uh, as for betting wise and stuff, I'm I'm not real sure if much has changed because of the whipping rule or not. Aaron, for some some of the drives at Northfield, you're only six hours away, but, uh, you know, it's a, a little bit different there. Uh, what are your thoughts on on the different rules you see in different jurisdictions? Um, I think it's easier just to be universal. Um, I actually, I, I take our whipping rule pretty much wherever I go. Like, so I don't, I don't think I, I don't drive with a cracker even most of the time. So like I thought I told myself, I think I whipped them enough when I raced at Raceway Park and when I first started at Northfield for the rest of my career. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause you, yeah. when you're younger, you know what I mean? You think that's okay. This is how you're going to make them go. This is how you make them go. But um, they'll go, most horses will go on their own and give you what they got, especially with the breed nowadays. But I mean, I, I see like Canada, you know, and, and, but then you look at the Meadowlands and these guys are one hand like anywhere, um, Yonkers. I mean, they're meleeing these things, you know, and we can't do any of that, you know, and our whipping right rules pretty strict. Like if you get, if you go past your shoulder, like, I mean, they're calling you in, like they're straight, it's three, it's 300 the first time, then it's days, it's th three days and five days. And then you get referred to the commission. So they're not, this is not a slap on the wrist here. Like there's no, and there's no warnings, but I'm um, not going to, I've never had a whipping violation ever on it at any track of any violation. So um, I've always kind of tried to uh, whatever, like, like I said, I whipped them enough <laughs> when I was younger I went at Raceway Park, but I, I think it's hard for gambling wise. I think it's, I think it's a really bad rule. I, I think that even if you don't whip them too much, I think you got to give them a little bit of urging. Um, that's just pretty much how we make our money. And um, people want to see these guys giving an effort. And then they want to call you in for not giving any effort because I know the guys will get a whipping fine and then they're going to really, they really put their whip away. And then they, they, the next week they get called in for a lack of effort. And I've seen it numerous times in Ohio. And I think it's uh, I think all you got to do is like John said, you, if the judge is a judge to me, they should be taking it case by case that look at every race. If a guy's over abusing a horse, nail the guy. You know what I mean? I think at least last 16th of a mile or last eighth of a mile or whatever, or in this stretch, I think the guy should be able to one hand, just because you, we are putting on a show as well and people are gambling on this um and the judges should just do their jobs and if a guy's abusing the horse fine him if a guy's whipping the horse and contents of the race you know what i mean and is competitive to get to that next spot to get money or to win the race then don't nail them i mean i think you just let them do their jobs i mean they're just they're sure making it easy on the judges to me in my opinion uh the, these whipping rules and the, the, yeah. bet, the most bet track in the country is the meadowlands and or the north america and they may lay them and you never hear a word about it. Yeah. Well, it's a, no, definitely a good point. You talked about, you talked about universal, um, universal rules. And, uh, that is certainly something that, uh, you know, we're hearing more about. And, uh, I, I think you're right. I think, uh, no matter which way you, you fall on uh, whatever the rule is, if it can be universal across North America, it's certainly uh, uh, the best situation. Um, uh, maybe we'll just finally end on, uh, uh, Montrell and Aaron, uh, just the status of, of things as, as much as you know, at least at this point, on where things stand and in terms of a potential return to racing. Montrell down in Delaware, uh, what are you hearing? You know what? There's not much. Uh, our racing 
exact uh, Sal, he he kind of put up that June 1st would maybe the, the time that we actually reopened, but we would only have two weeks left before we would have to close again. So is it really worth it just open for two weeks and then close right back down? So I, I think we're just going to wait till August or maybe just wait till Dover. Okay. And Aaron, what are you, what are you hearing in Ohio? Yikes. <laughs> um, you hear a lot of different things. There's actually a chance before I was hearing that maybe the qualify some here, the second week of, or the third week of May. Um, but I know that our governor is kind of on board to let us race with no fans. Um, but unfortunately, there's, there's like some kind of fairness of the racetracks because one racetrack does not want to open until the casino opens. So, um, but Northfield has got, you know, a lot of money in their purse account and we can race five or six months probably, even though they want to go past a certain point um, without even changing the purses, you know, with what we have in there now. Um, so I don't know, man. I, I'm thinking the only thing I think is good is Indiana did. And they actually set a date and their coronavirus thing is a little bit worse in Ohio. And they said um, June 14th, they will be racing. So I'm hoping that maybe best case scenario to me, qualify at the end of May, first week of June, and they are making everybody qualify um, and then start racing, you know, right after. Um, that, that is ideal. That's what I'm hoping. Um, but if it doesn't happen, hey, buckle down and just wait. <laughs> yeah, that's all we can do. And Ontario, very similar. Um, hoping for uh, perhaps early June, early to mid-June. And uh, the numbers in Ontario in terms of new cases have been definitely encouraging and uh, signs from government uh, are that they want to try and start reopening the economy and they've already started to do that. So fingers crossed. And uh, again, we want to thank uh, the three gentlemen uh, for joining us tonight. There's a look at the poll question results coming up next. And uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good race here. And uh, we asked you off the top, which of these days annually produces the best card of racing? The best overall card of racing. And it was pretty close between the Hamiltonian and the Breeders' Crown, but the Hamiltonian came out on top with 34% Breeders' Crown. Little Brown Jug and the Pepsi North America Cup. They are four wonderful days of racing. And uh, boy, we are excited uh, for the return of those events and just the return of racing in general. And uh, again, gentlemen, we want to thank you very much for taking a couple of hours and joining us tonight. Uh, stay healthy and safe and uh, good luck. And we hope uh, to see you on the racetrack here uh, coming up soon. Uh, we'll go next to our trivia questions just to wrap up uh, the show here tonight. Uh, recap the answers oh. for you. I asked you earlier, Montrell, first major stakes victory came with Custard the Dragon. One of the many great horses from the Teague Stable. I knew that. And which race was it? The Hemped Final in 2011. Aaron, you've got a sidebar? I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that one. Uh, yeah, so nine years ago already. And uh, the first of many stakes wins for Montreal. Our second trivia question. Asking uh, which horse Jonathan drove who eventually became a millionaire. He drove uh, to his first career win, and he raced that year in the Million Dollar Metro Final, and it was Vegas Vacation. He won his uh, first uh, start with Jonathan driving at Mohawk in July of 2012, a 154 and four victory, and went on to a million dollar plus racing career. And our final question, who was the second driver in history to record 1,000 plus <laughs> wins in a single season? And in fact, it was Tim Tetrick in 2000, or actually, no, that's incorrect. My apologies. We, Tony we Morgan. Uh, had the wrong one. It's Tony Morgan. You're right. I sent the change in, but I don't think I changed it uh, in time for Curtis this afternoon. But uh, yeah, in fact, it was Tony Morgan in 2006, and then uh, Tetrick the very next year in 2007. So again, gentlemen, thanks uh, so much for joining us and want to wish you all the best. Aaron thank Merriman, thank you. Montreal Teague, and Jonathan Drury. And we thank you for joining us here tonight dance. on Costa TV. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Another uh, episode of Ozark for me. Thanks again, guys. <laughs> and uh, don't forget, we'll be back uh, with more Costa TV this coming Wednesday night, 730. And we hope to see you then. Good night. COSA, the Central Ontario Standard Bread Association proudly serving Ontario horse people with integrity and accountability. Collaborative, supportive,
helping to ensure a vibrant harness racing industry, lifetime membership is free and there are many benefits. Become a new member today. COSA, representing the interests of horse people racing at Ontario racetracks. To find out more, visit cosaonline.com.